Chapter four covers the Jacobian singularities and velocity kinematics. The Jacobian is a partial derivative matrix of n effector position with respect to joint position, and it is used to find singularities and velocities. So we'll start with talking about the Jacobian, and then later videos will cover singularities and velocity kinematics. The Jacobian is the derivative of position with respect to joint variables. So here you can see the partial derivative matrix where F is the XYZ equation of the forward kinematics for the robot, the end effector position. Q represents a joint variable, so that would be D or theta. Then that del sign is a partial derivative, so derivative of F with respect to Q. N is the number of joints and M is the number of equations. So the columns represent which joint and there are N columns. The rows represent which equation, like F, Y, Z, roll, pitch, y'all. So generally, M is never going to be greater than six, but N could be greater than six if there are more joints. We just can't have more degrees of freedom than 3D space for the end effector. The Jacobian is what we can use for forward and inverse kinematics to relate the tip pose to the joint positions. For derivative kinematics, it relates task space to joint space velocities. So task space is what the end effector, the claw of the robot, is moving through. And joint space is the positions of the actual joints of the robot. So down here, x dot is task space and theta dot is joint space. The Jacobian actually has lots of uses in robotics. So we can use it to find singular configurations, which is when a degree of freedom is lost, or joint axes align and lock out. We can also use it to plan and execute trajectories, coordinate motion, position, velocity, acceleration, derive dynamic equations of motion, find required joint torque given end effector force and torque, so we know like how strong of a motor do we need on each joint and resolve redundancies, which is when the robot has more degrees of freedom, more joints than there are actual 3D space degrees of freedom. For the differential kinematics, we can use these equations, xi equals jq dot or x dot equals j theta dot. So we can set it up in a matrix like this. So psi, which is the joint twist, has linear and angular velocities. The Jacobian also has a linear and an angular component. And then the final matrix of Q has the joint velocities. So this Q matrix is going to be, has n elements and it's a column vector. It has one element for each joint. And then psi is always a six by one. So that means the Jacobian is going to be six by n. We can see what that formula would look like all here. So x, y, z are the top three elements and then roll pitch y'all are the bottom three elements. And then the, each column corresponds to each joint. So there are two ways to find the Jacobian. For an in-link robot with joint variables Q1 to Qn, the forward kinematics are given. We can find the Jacobian using either a basic method, which is for simple robots, like if they have three or fewer joints. And for more complicated robots, we can use a formula method. So more on each of those specific methods in later videos, but we'll do a brief overview right now. So for the basic method, we write the forward kinematics equations for position, take the derivative for velocity, and put it into matrix form. For the formula method, then we use a similar procedure where first we have to get the forward kinematics, but then we need to locate the origin of each joint and the z-axis vector for each joint. And then we can do the math by categories for getting the velocity 
the linear and angular Jacobians for R joints and P joints using these formulas. So for revolute joints, we have a cross product. And for prismatic joints, we just have the z-axis for linear. And then for angular, prismatic is zero, revolute is the z-axis. More on these methods in a later video. There are actually four different types of Jacobians. The geometric or the standard Jacobian is the one that we mainly use in this class. This is the one that we just learned, and it gives body, linear, and angular velocity in the world frame. The body Jacobian gives the linear and angular velocity of the tip relative to the world, but it's expressed in the tip frame. The spatial Jacobian is a linear velocity of a point passing through the world frame origin, and the analytical Jacobian is used to find ineffective velocity and position using Euler angles. So mainly we will stick to the standard Jacobian, but you may see some of these other terms used occasionally. This is how the analytical Jacobian works. You find ineffective velocity and position using Euler angles. So to get the analytical Jacobian, then the First row is pretty straightforward. You have identity matrix and then zero. Remember, each of these is a three by three because this Jacobian would be a six by six. And then also a zero matrix bottom left. And the B, you calculate from those Euler angles. And it comes, so you calculate that and then plug it into this formula. Then you multiply all of that by the standard Jacobian and you can get the analytical one. If you want to calculate velocity of a specific point, then you can also use the Jacobian for that. So normally you would use the Jacobian to calculate ineffector velocities from the joint velocities, but instead you could write the forward kinematics equations to the point instead of to the tip of the robot. So if you write those equations to any point, you can use the basic or the formula method to get the Jacobian, and then you can find the velocity of that point. It's like placing the tool frame at the point P. To get joint velocities from end effector velocity, then we actually have to do a matrix inverse. So let's say you want the tip to move at a certain speed. And you wanna know how do we control the joint velocities to do that? You can use the matrix inverse. So in MATLAB, you would write that as INV parentheses J or just J backslash if you want to do this in a simulation. To get acceleration, then we just take the derivative of the velocity equation. But we have to remember, it's not just the joint velocities that are changing, it's the Jacobian is changing too. So we use product rule right here to take the derivative of this. So it would be j dot times q dot plus j times q double dot. So then, in MATLAB, you could also program it in just like this. And you have to index, so Q of I, you're indexing because it's changing every single time. You can only take the inverse of Jacobian if it is square. Redundant robots have more degrees of freedom than they're needed, so they have too many joints, which means that in two-dimensional space, they would have more than three joints, or in 3D space, they'd have more than six joints. So this means the Jacobian is not square because it's a six by n. So if n is greater than six, you have to use a pseudo inverse. So this is JJ transpose, which is a square matrix, times JJ transpose inverse. So then you are multiplying two square matrices by each other, but it's kind of like an undoing thing so that comes up to be j times j plus, where j plus is n by six. So then you can use that pseudo inverse to find the joint velocities by multiplying it by the end effector velocity. In MATLAB, they, like you can use this pseudo inverse formula if you want, or you can use their built-in function. It's just called PINV of j. Now this second term out here with the arrow through it, this 
helps to guide the joint velocities if you want a special joint behavior. So if you just want to minimize joint speeds, which is pretty typical, then you can set B equal to zero. Otherwise, you can change B and you get kind of different behaviors out of the system. That is called the basis for the null space of J because if you multiply all of that junk, so starting with the I minus J plus J times B, you multiply all of that times the original Jacobian, then it's going to equal zero. The Jacobian can also be used to indicate manipulability, which is how close you are to a singularity. So the manipulability factor is shown by the variable mu, and it is generally between zero and one. So if we look at this picture, if mu is zero, then you're really close to a singularity. So you can see that the oval gets pretty squished. And if mu is one, you're like kind of right there in the sweet spot and you're not close to a singularity and you can get a pretty big range out the end effector.